Hey everybody, Trey here. Welcome back to another video. Today we're going to dive into an event that is considered one of the more notable surprise significant tornado events in recent memory, and that is the Plainfield, Illinois F5 on August 28, 1990. This tornado cut a 16 mile long path of destruction through the Chicago suburbs with little warning, killing 29 and injuring 350 while destroying up to 470 homes. The Plainfield tornado was unique in that it was the first recorded F3 plus tornado to occur in Illinois in the month of August, and it remains the only F5 or EF5 to occur in August in the United States since records began in 1950. In addition, no known photos or videos exist of the tornado itself, so it's hard to reconstruct some of the important aspects of the supercell and tornado, but what we do know is that it was violent and produced some pretty incredible damage as you see here, really from a setup that on the surface did not appear to support significant tornadoes. So in this video, we're going to dive into the meteorology behind this event and discuss what took this from a typical summertime severe weather setup to a setup that produced one of the most intense tornadoes in U.S. history. As we discussed in our last case study on the April 26, 1991 tornado outbreak, these older cases are a lot tougher to analyze in depth because the data archives I typically use for these case studies either don't go back that far or have significant gaps, and the quality of data back then, especially for something like radar, was much lower than it is in recent years. If you recall from our April 26, 1991 case study, the National Weather Service at the time was in the process of rolling out the new network of WSR 88D radars, what we use today, across the U.S., and the only such one that was operational at the time was the one in Norman, Oklahoma. So unfortunately, we don't have any original radar data to analyze for the Plainfield case. NWS Chicago has tried to recreate some of the radar data using GIS, and we have some drawings from Dr. Ted Fujita in his paper on the Plainfield tornado, but we unfortunately won't be able to go super in-depth on any radar features like we do in the more modern cases. Also, keep in mind that most of the upper air data we'll be analyzing will be reanalysis data, basically an estimate, rather than actual observed upper air data. It's a really good estimate, and it'll still give us the ability to dive into the meteorology of this event fairly accurately, but it's an estimate nonetheless. And just a little plug for the Patreon page for the channel, I actually put out a poll so current members could select my next case study, and Plainfield ended up being the winner, so that's why we're covering the Plainfield case in this video. If you'd like to support the channel and have a say on future video ideas alongside other perks, head on over to the Patreon page at the link on your screen, which is also in the description box below. A big thank you to those of you who have become a patron so far. So without further ado, let's go ahead and get started. So the day began with the National Severe Storms Forecast Center, or NSSFC, the precursor to the Storm Prediction Center, outlining a slight risk from the Midwest into the Northeast and Eastern Seaboard in their initial 6Z outlook. As the threat for severe weather became more apparent throughout the day, they upgraded to a moderate risk from parts of Nebraska, Iowa, and Missouri all the way eastward into New York and Pennsylvania at 18Z. The Plainfield tornado began just after 20Z, carving a 16.4 mile path that started near Oswego at 3.16 p.m., intensifying as it approached the northwest side of Plainfield where it produced a small corridor of F5 damage before dissipating at 3.42 p.m. near Joliet. There were 11 other tornadoes that occurred during this event generally focused on southern Ontario and New York, including one that produced F3 damage near the town of Port Stanley in southern Ontario. All right, let's dive into the meteorology behind this event. We'll start off at 500 millibars at 12Z, 7 a.m. Central Standard Time on August 28, 1990, and this is a pretty typical pattern for the summer across the United States. Big ridge of high pressure parked over the southern half of the country, with some disturbances rotating atop it. In this case, we have a well-defined trough centered over Hudson Bay in Canada, with a belt of enhanced, mostly zonal flow moving between the trough's base and the southern U.S. ridge. This jet streak would migrate slowly southeast throughout the day, with little change in amplitude. With at least some northerly component to the flow aloft, this event can be classified as a typical northwest flow severe weather outbreak, as described by meteorologist Bob Johns in his 1982 paper. As always, all papers I mentioned in this video will be listed in the description box below. In Johns' 1984, he determined that over two-thirds of all northwest flow severe weather outbreaks are associated with 500 millibar jet maxima of over 50 knots, and we can easily check that box here. 60 to 70 knots of flow within the core of the jet streak for the duration of the event. 500 millibar temperatures tend to average around minus 11 degrees Celsius in northwest flow severe weather outbreaks in the upper Midwest. We were right around that number in the Plainfield case with the dashed red lines or isotherms showing widespread minus 10 to minus 12 degrees Celsius from northern Illinois into the northeast. In addition, Johns found that northwest flow severe weather outbreaks tend to be associated with little change in 500 millibar heights throughout the event. If you recall, height, or more specifically geopotential height, is the height of a constant pressure surface, in this case 500 millibars, above mean sea level. 
These black contours on the 500 millibar map represent geopotential height, with lower heights closer to the trough center and higher heights with southward extent. Here, if we focus on the upper Midwest, including northern Illinois, we see that during the morning and afternoon on August 28th, height contours did move south slightly. In other words, heights did decrease some across the upper Midwest, which would lead to broad scale rising motion in this region. But overall, the height decrease was not really all that significant. Finally, John's 1984 suggests that 500 millibar jet maxima associated with the vast majority of Northwest flow severe weather outbreaks are located west-northwest to north-northeast of and in fairly close proximity to the outbreak area, as illustrated in his figure one here. Looking at our 500 millibar data at 20Z, you'll notice that the jet max is situated just off to the north or northwest of the bulk of our tornado reports from this event. So all in all, the background pattern in the mid-levels has a lot of the characteristics for typical northwest flow severe weather outbreaks. Now, when I say northwest flow severe weather outbreak, that encompasses all severe weather hazards, not just tornadoes. In fact, John's 1982 found that severe wind is the most common hazard with these northwest flow events, followed by large hail, and tornadoes are actually the least common hazard. Hawker 2004 compared southwest and northwest flow severe weather events in the southern plains and found that southwest flow events see over twice the amount of tornado reports per event than northwest flow events, and about 30% of southwest flow events produce significant tornadoes, compared to only 5% of northwest flow events. Mesoscale convective systems are the favored storm mode in northwest flow environments, meaning that damaging wind tends to reign supreme in these setups. To see such a widespread tornado outbreak that included a violent tornado is extremely rare in northwest flow cases, so our job is to figure out why that happened in this case. Heading down to the surface, we see a pretty quiescent pattern across much of the U.S., as is typical during the summer. With the main mid and upper level trough situated across Canada, the resultant broad surface flow was displaced well to the north of our area of interest as well, near the south shore of Hudson Bay to start the day. A cold front was draped down to the southwest through the Great Lakes into the Midwest and Central Plains. The surface low would make slow eastward progress during the day, and this allowed the trailing end of the cold front to move rather slowly to the southeast. Here's a closer look at the frontal zone using our raw surface observations. These maps were analyzed by hand by WPC forecasters on the day of the event. We start off with a very juicy air mass in place across the region, with dew points in the low to mid-70s, as is typical during the summer in the Midwest. Surface low located well off to the northeast near the southern tip of Hudson Bay, and here's our frontal zone, draped nearly west to east from Nebraska into Iowa and Wisconsin. Surface winds are a little chaotic, but we can see generally southwesterly flow south of the front, with more northwesterly flow on the cool side, so this frontal placement is pretty accurate. Across the upper Midwest, the cold front would slowly drift south or southeast throughout the day. This was not a typical cold front that surges rapidly, likely initiating ample convection along it and undercutting that convection quickly. This front was slow moving with a relatively weak temperature gradient across it, low to mid 90s ahead of it, low to mid 80s behind it. So the forcing associated with this cold front was a lot more muted than a typical cold front, which would have implications on storm mode in this environment. Even with a lack of significant driving forces for low level moisture advection, dew points remained elevated and even increased throughout the day, likely in part due to evapotranspiration from the widespread cornfields, and temperatures would soar into the 90s by the afternoon. 90 over 75 at Chicago by 1 p.m., and 91 over 80 at Peoria at 4 p.m. Definitely a stifling, sauna-esque day for those ahead of the cold front, providing plenty of juice for storms. This surface pattern matches closely with the prototypical Northwest Flow Severe Weather Surface Pattern laid out in Galway 1958, which was the first research done on Northwest Flow events. John's 1984 identified variations to this pattern among his database of Northwest Flow Severe Events, but he found that the original Galway pattern, in which the area of interest occurs in the warm air mass ahead of a cold front draped down to the southwest of a surface low, as you see here, holds true in about 20% of Northwest Flow outbreaks, and the Plainfield case was no different. Given that our main synoptic scale forcing mechanism was displaced well off to the northeast, so was our main low-level response. Across the Midwest, the low-level response was weak at best, and we can really see that at 850 millibars. Heading into the afternoon, we see only about 10 to 20 knots of low-level flow across northern Illinois. We did have a bit of an enhancement ahead of what appears to be a little shortwave, perhaps a manifestation of the cold front aloft. About 30 to 40 knots of flow from southern Ontario into New York, helping to increase low-level shear there. But back to the west, not much low-level shear to speak of. We did have strong deep-layer shear, however. Low-level winds out of the west or west-southwest at 10 knots or so, veering and strengthening to west-northwesterly at about 40 to 45 knots at 500 millibars, certainly supportive of organized convection, including supercells.
Also, the deep layer shear vectors did exhibit some perpendicularity to the initiating boundary, which was the cold front. That, coupled with the slow-moving, diffuse nature of the cold front, suggested that we might have a decent window for discrete supercells, not something that all northwest flow events feature. But the tornado threat appeared very limited given extremely modest low-level winds. Let's take a look at a couple soundings now to get a full picture of the environment. We'll start off with the 12Z observed sounding at Peoria, Illinois, about 95 miles southwest of Plainfield. First thing to note is the relatively poor quality of low-level moisture. 73 over 73 at the surface, but notice how the red line, which is our atmospheric temperature profile, and the green line, which is our dew point profile, separate from each other almost immediately above the surface. This indicates very shallow low-level moisture beneath a relatively deep layer of warmer, drier air. This is somewhat unfavorable for robust convective development, especially with the resultant warm nose or capping inversion. However, intense surface heating and some degree of low-level moistening were expected, which would help improve the low-level profile and make it more supportive of sustained, robust convection. Part of this warm, dry layer was due to a bit of an elevated mix layer, or EML, as evidenced by this layer of steeper lapse rates centered around 700 millibars. As we often discuss on this channel, the EML is that layer of warm, dry, well-mixed air that emanates from the higher terrain out west and gets transported atop the low-level moist layer out east amid the westerly or southwesterly mid-level flow. This helps thwart thunderstorm development for much of the day until the cap erodes and allows instability to build effectively. In this case, the EML likely emanated from the higher terrain of the northern Rockies and had been ushered in on the west-northwesterly mid-level flow. Despite the less than favorable low-level thermodynamics, impressive instability was already in place to start the day, with mixed layer cape exceeding 3,000 joules per kilogram. The stout low-level inversion would help hold off convective development for a while until the combination of low-level heating and moistening and the subtle height falls we discussed earlier would fully destabilize the atmosphere. Taking a look at the wind profile, we have adequate deep layer shear for supercells with about 44 knots of effective bulk shear. We actually do have a bit of veering of the low-level winds with height, leading to some modest curvature in the low levels of the hodograph. 0 to 1 km storm relative helicity in excess of 150 meters squared per second squared, which would certainly favor a low-end tornado threat. However, this would change a bit as we went into the afternoon. Here is our 18Z sounding, which is a model reanalysis sounding taken at 1 p.m. at Romeoville, Illinois, which is the present-day location of NWS Chicago, about six miles northeast of Plainfield, so in very close proximity to the tornadic supercell. The surface conditions have been modified to match the nearest observed surface temperature and dew point at the time, which was a juicy 91 over 75. Very hot but very moist, with temperature dew point spreads high but well within that 20 degree rule of thumb for tornadic activity. As a result, instability had continued to skyrocket with mixed layer cape in excess of 6,000 joules per kilogram, which is considered extreme. Just for context, 2,500 joules per kilogram is considered strong, so the fact that we had over double that in the atmosphere meant that a powder keg for explosive thunderstorm development was sitting over northern Illinois, waiting for an initiation mechanism to get things going. Low-level instability was also very high, 0 to 3 kilometer cape nearing 150 joules per kilogram, indicating strong low-level updrafts. Now it's not all that uncommon to see such explosive instability in the plains and midwest during the summer when a hot, moist air mass is often in place across these regions, but it's still impressive nonetheless. The moist layer had deepened a bit, up to about 900 millibars or so, not significantly deep by any means, but much improved from the morning sounding. Still a bit of low-level dry air remaining, but again, much improved from the morning sounding, and by this time we were fully destabilized with no remaining convective inhibition. As a result, storms began to fire along the cold front, including along the Illinois-Wisconsin border. Deep layer shear remained favorable for supercells, with effective bulk shear just shy of 50 knots. However, as the cold front approached, the near-surface winds veered pretty substantially from what we saw in the morning, shifting from southwesterly at 12Z to almost due westerly at 18Z, negating some of that early low-level shear and promoting an even more straight-line hodograph, unfavorable for tornadoes, let alone significant tornadoes. Let's dig a bit more deeply into the hodograph to assess some characteristics of any potential supercells in this environment. We'll start by analyzing low-level storm relative inflow, which is the vector drawn from our storm motion to the low levels of the hodograph, particularly below one kilometer. Storm relative inflow modulates the amount of mass being ingested by the supercell and therefore how large the updraft is. Stronger zero to one kilometer storm relative inflow, generally above 35 knots, promotes larger supercells, while weaker storm relative inflow, generally below 25 knots, tends to promote smaller supercells. In this case, we have 25 to 30 knots or so of 0 to 1 kilometer storm relative inflow. There's 10, there's 20, so 25 to 30 knots or so, meaning that supercells in this environment might tend to be a bit on the smaller side, not quite mini supercells, but perhaps smaller than normal. 
Now let's look at upper level storm relative outflow drawn from our storm motion to the upper levels of the hodograph generally above 6 kilometers. Storm relative outflow modulates how precipitation is vented away from the updraft base. Stronger upper level storm relative outflow, generally above 40 knots, efficiently vents precipitation away from the updraft base, yielding a much better view of a storm's area of interest, while weaker storm relative outflow, generally below 20 knots, tends to foster more high precipitation storms that make viewing any tornadic activity difficult. Here we have very limited storm relative outflow through at least the 6 to 8 kilometer layer or so, maybe 15 to 20 knots at most, meaning that precipitation will not be vented away from the updraft well at all, yielding very high precipitation supercells. This is part of the reason why we don't have any photos or videos of the Plainfield tornado itself, despite it barreling through a highly populated area. So we've established that we had a pretty explosive environment in place for supercells, but we still haven't been able to explain how we were able to get a violent tornado out of this setup. Because the synoptics couldn't give us the answer, there has to be something at the storm scale that got the job done, so let's take a closer look at this storm and see if we can solve the mystery. Now again, we don't have much in the way of high resolution data to help us out with this, so we're going to have to do some pretty intense forensics and make some assumptions and guesses, but let's try our best. As mentioned earlier, ample surface heating and blossoming instability allowed storms to explode ahead of the cold front around 1 p.m. near the Illinois-Wisconsin border, as you can see on these visible satellite images. The convection was fairly isolated in nature, as expected given the somewhat muted forcing. Here is some radar data that was digitized and colorized by NWS Chicago using GIS. They reconstructed this from the original WSR-74 data, which looked like this. Not a whole lot one can gather from this data other than some precipitation intensity estimates and some basic storm characteristics. This played a big role in the overall lack of warning for this storm. A severe thunderstorm warning was issued at 3.23 p.m., seven minutes after the tornado began, but it did not indicate tornadic activity, and a tornado warning was not issued until after the Plainfield tornado lifted. This event became a clear example of why upgraded Doppler radar was a necessity, and it added fuel to the push for installing the new WSR-88D network. Thanks to the efforts of NWS Chicago to make the original data a bit more readable, at least we have some data to analyze for this case. The data runs from 1927 to 2049 Z, so 227 to 349 p.m. As a reminder, the Plainfield tornado occurred between 316 and 342 p.m. We'll also be using sketches made by Dr. Ted Fujita that combine radar data with his damage survey results. These were included in Fujita's 1993 paper on the Plainfield Tornado. Unfortunately, this paper is paywalled, but it's one of the foundational publications on this event, so it was more than worth it to purchase access. I'll still put a link in the description box below if you'd like to check it out yourself. We start out at 2.27 p.m. The storm appears somewhat disorganized as it moves to the southeast through the town of DeKalb toward the Aurora area. You can also see this fine line develop out to the southwest of the storm. This is an outflow boundary and indicates that the storm was producing a lot of outflow and was perhaps outflow dominant, which is when the cold outflow surges out ahead of the storm, cuts off its influx of warm moist air, and negates its ability to produce tornadoes. Fujita also found widespread evidence of 80 to 100 mile per hour downburst winds in his damage survey, as demarcated by the blue line and arrows in his figure 19. This area consisted of ample crop damage and was 10 to 12 miles wide at times. Before the Plainfield tornado began, there were as many as four embedded micro-scale vortices that Fujita classified as tornadoes within the broader area of downburst winds, but for the most part, the storm appeared to be outflow dominant at this point. We have some corroborating evidence to support this. As we discussed earlier, there are no known videos of the Plainfield tornado itself, but we do have two separate videos of the parent supercell prior to tornado genesis. This first one was taken by Jay Orbick as the supercell impacted DeKalb, Illinois around 2.45 p.m., about 30 minutes before the Plainfield tornado began. And this second one is comprised of numerous clips leading up to the Plainfield tornado taken by Paul Servatka, who is a long-tenured meteorology professor at the College of DuPage and was chasing the Plainfield supercell with some of his students. In both videos, the storm exhibits some classic signs of being outflow dominant. In the Orbick video, you can see an expansive shelf cloud ahead of a beefy precipitation core. As the leading edge moves closer and Orbic zooms in, notice how the clouds are solely moving right to left across the screen instead of rotating. Both of these clues suggest that the storm is producing ample straight line winds in the form of outflow. In the Servatka video, the storm initially looks very disorganized. There's no real concentrated area of visible rotation. Instead, it looks like a raggedy leading edge with a thick precipitation core behind it. It just has that look of a typical summertime outflow dominant storm. Early on, you could even see a bit of a rain foot where the bottom of the rain shaft is bending outward. That is evidence of a downburst, 
The strong winds within the downburst hit the ground and spread out, taking some of the precipitation with it and yielding this rainfoot feature. So it's pretty clear that the storm was outflow dominant during this stage of its life cycle. Perhaps as the surface continued to warm, those temperature dew point spreads increased a bit, leading to slightly higher cloud bases and a slightly greater tendency for downdraft production. Perhaps some of that low-level dry air that we saw on our soundings was working its way into the downdrafts, helping to evaporate some of the precipitation and accelerate those downdraft winds. But there was a clear point where the supercell transitioned from outflow dominant to inflow dominant, signaling the onset of tornado genesis. Notice in Fujita's drawing that the area of outflow shrinks significantly and funnels directly into the starting point of the plain field tornado. We also see the development of a well-defined hook echo immediately preceding tornado genesis on radar. The storm takes on a bit of that classic kidney bean shape at 3.02 p.m., and by 3.12 p.m. the hook is extremely apparent. Note the outflow boundary is still present at this time, extending out to the west. Visually, we can see a change in the storm's character as well. It goes from this disheveled outflowy mess to developing a rain-free base and wall cloud on its southwest flank. That wall cloud quickly becomes very well-defined, very blocky. This clip was taken around 3.05 p.m. and Servatco is located just northeast of the wall cloud looking southwest. And if you're a storm chaser, you can tell the storm is now starting to get quote-unquote the look. Cloud bases have lowered significantly. Here's your forward flank gust front. And here's your mesocyclone as evidenced by the blocky, beefy wall cloud. Now it has the features of an incipient tornadic supercell, and about 10 minutes after this video, the Plainfield tornado would begin its rampage. So given this progression, given these clues, my main hypothesis on why we were able to get a significant tornado from this storm is that the outflow boundary initially surged slightly out ahead of the supercell, making it outflow dominant, but then it started to ingest that outflow boundary, allowing it to become inflow dominant and consummate tornado genesis. Now, I've seen this happen before out in the field. Some of you chasers out there might remember this beautiful, dusty tornado near the town of Tahoka, Texas on May 5th, 2019. Interestingly, this was also a southeastward moving tornado. I was on this storm from its inception and watched these processes happen in real time. And of course, with this case, we have high resolution radar data to show you how it happened. Here's some reflectivity data of the Tahoka storm. It starts out pretty disorganized, multiple updrafts trying to get their acts together. As you can see from my footage here, these storms were quite high-based initially, similar to the Plainfield storm. We start to see them produce a lot of outflow, and the outflow boundary, which is this extensive fine line you see here, surges slightly out ahead of the storm cluster, indicating that they are undercut and outflow dominant. Here's my view of the cluster at the time, and you can clearly see the shelf cloud on the leading edge, denoting the outflow boundary. You can also see quite a bit of dust moving right to left across the screen, indicating strong, straight-line outflow winds. Then the updrafts merge into one dominant supercell that appears to distort and ingest its own outflow boundary, a well-developed hook echo appears, and tornado genesis occurs at the inflection point. Here's a closer look. This same process may have happened in the Plainfield case. The storms start out disorganized and subsequently produce a lot of outflow. Again, this is very low resolution data, so there's a margin of error where the outflow boundary you see here could have surged slightly out ahead of the ongoing storm. The radar back then just couldn't resolve it. But then the storm starts to develop a notable hook echo as it perhaps re-ingests its own outflow boundary and tornado genesis is consummated. You can even see as we go to 3.21 p.m. how there's a lot more reflectivity straddling the outflow boundary, perhaps denoting that the storm was in fact interacting with it. The boundary may have provided that extra low-level shear and vorticity to compensate for the lack of low-level shear in the environment, and with such strong low-level instability at play, that spin would be efficiently tilted and stretched into the vertical to aid in tornado genesis. Now, I've seen a lot of comments saying that it was the extreme instability that was the main driving factor for the Plainfield tornado, but I just don't believe that's the case. Yes, when an environment exhibits explosive instability like this, that can lead to more explosive updrafts and often stronger low-level instability, which, as we've discussed ad nauseum on the channel before, can have a positive impact on tornado genesis in supercells in that environment. However, if you don't have the right wind profile or something to augment the wind profile in favor of significant tornadoes, you're not going to get significant tornadoes, even with 5, 6, 7,000 joules per kilogram of CAPE. If extreme cape was the main discriminating factor for significant tornadoes, then we'd see them with many a setup during the summer, 
As I mentioned earlier, extreme instability, as was in place for the Plainfield event, is not all that uncommon, especially in the late spring and summer months, during which a hot and moist air mass often settles into a vast majority of the plains and Midwest. But significant tornadoes are rare during this time frame because we just don't often get a favorable wind profile to coexist with the intense instability. Here are a couple examples. May 27, 2017 was a setup where convection was expected to fire in an extremely unstable environment along the dry line in central Oklahoma, as well as farther northeast where a moderate risk was in place for a possible derecho during the evening hours. 10% hatched area for significant tornadoes was outlined from eastern Oklahoma into southwest Missouri, and everyone was preparing for a big day. Here's the 0Z sounding at Norman, Oklahoma on that day. 91 over 73 at the surface with massive instability. Mixed layer cape approaching 6,000 joules per kilogram and 3 cape over 120 joules per kilogram. But that wind profile leaves a lot to be desired. Plenty of deep layer shear for supercells, but very limited low level shear. Weak low level winds not strengthening a whole lot with height, which is quite unfavorable for significant tornadoes. And lo and behold, not much happened in the tornado department. Mostly hail and wind reports across the region with a couple brief and or low-end tornadoes reported across central and northeastern Oklahoma, but nothing significant. I was out chasing on this day and you could visually see the cumulonimbus billowing rapidly amid the extreme instability. We got on a discrete supercell in southern Oklahoma near Lehigh. It had a wall cloud, a bit of motion, and quickly went tornado warned, but as it crossed the road in front of us, the base became flat again, and nothing else happened. How about June 12th, 2022? Large area of severe potential from the northern high plains into the eastern seaboard, with elevated potential from South Dakota into Nebraska and from Missouri into Illinois and Indiana. The highest tornado risk was draped across the enhanced risk area with limited potential elsewhere. Here's the 0Z sounding at Topeka, Kansas. Again, explosive instability, mixed layer cape upwards of 5,000 joules per kilogram, but a pretty poor hodograph, not much low level and even deep layer shear to speak of. What happened? Not much at all. A bunch of damaging wind reports and a few hill reports, especially in proximity to that Topeka sounding. A few brief tornado reports across South Dakota, but overall mostly a non-tornadic event. So this just goes to show that you can have all the instability you want, but if you don't have the wind profile to match or something to augment the wind profile, then you're not going to get significant tornadoes. The Plainfield event followed the same rules. Extreme instability with limited low-level shear but we had something that augmented the unfavorable background wind profile, which was likely the interaction of the supercell with its outflow boundary, as we just discussed. Now, that's not to say instability didn't play a role at all. In the Tohoka, Texas case, as you see here, we had 3,000 joules per kilogram mixed layer cape and 80 joules per kilogram 0 to 3 kilometer cape, and we got a pretty stout EF2 tornado. Whereas in the Plainfield case, we had basically double the instability, 6,000 joules per kilogram mixed layer cape and about 150 joules per kilogram of 3 cape, meaning that those same processes at work in the Tohoka case, if they did in fact play a role in the Plainfield event, would be magnified. For example, more intense tilting and stretching of outflow boundary vorticity, which might lead to a more intense tornado. But the extreme instability itself was not the main reason why we saw a violent tornado from the Plainfield event. All right, now that we've discussed how the Plainfield tornado may have formed in a somewhat unfavorable environment, let's talk about a few interesting features of the Plainfield supercell and tornado itself. First, the Plainfield supercell appeared to undergo significant changes in the characteristics of its cloud-to-ground, or CG, lightning output as it went from non-tornadic to tornadic, as documented in Simon 1993. We'll be referring to his figure 8 for our discussion. Fujita's downburst area and tornado path are outlined in black, and positive CG lightning strikes are indicated by red plus signs, while negative CG strikes are indicated by blue dots. For those of you who may not be familiar with the intricacies of lightning, there are two types of CG lightning differentiated by the type of charge the bolt brings from the cloud to the ground. Negative lightning, which constitutes the vast majority of CG lightning strikes and involves a bolt that brings negative charges from the cloud to the ground, and positive lightning, which are much more rare and bring positive charges from the cloud to the ground. If you've ever seen those lightning bolts that arc well out from a thunderstorm updraft, you've likely seen positive lightning. In the first two hours of storm development, during which the Plainfield storm was mostly non-tornadic except for those few brief tornadoes embedded within the larger area of downburst winds outlined by Fujita, a whopping 91% of its CG lightning output consisted of positive bolts, compared to the national average of only 5%. Other storms that developed along the cold front farther east did not display this same behavior and produced mostly negative bolts. In addition, most of the developing Plainfield Storm's positive bolts occurred within the precipitation core, which is unusual for positive lightning. As you saw a moment ago, most positive bolts extend well out from a thunderstorm anvil, so to have most of the positive bolts occur in the precipitation core and almost all negative bolts occur outside of the precipitation core is highly unusual. 
This suggests that the storm developed with what we call an inverted dipole structure. In basic terms, a dipole is simply the distribution of positive and negative charges within a thunderstorm cloud. Generally, a thunderstorm's middle and lower portions are mostly negatively charged, with positive charges relegated to its upper portions, including the anvil, except for perhaps a few stragglers in the lower portion. This is the typical dipole structure of a thunderstorm, and it's why most positive CG lightning emanates from the top of the storm cloud. However, sometimes these charges can be flipped, where negative charges occupy the top of the thunderhead, and positive charges occupy its middle and lower sections, which is an inverted dipole structure. The vast majority of CG strikes in thunderstorms with a typical dipole structure are negative, while the majority of CG strikes in thunderstorms with an inverted dipole structure tend to be positive. The latter appears to be what happened with the Plainfield Storm and explains why the Plainfield Storm was so efficient at producing positive CG lightning. From 2.48 to 2.53 p.m., which encompasses the development of the major downburst identified by Fujita, the lightning flash rate in the Plainfield Storm jumps from 5 to 11 flashes per minute and peaks between 14 and 17 flashes per minute from 2.53 to 3.03 p.m. During this time, the percentage of positive bolts reached 100% and these bolts were focused on the region of the developing mesocyclone, while almost no bolts occurred in the downburst region. Subsequently, flash rates plummeted to 3 flashes per minute at 3.05 p.m., which is coincident with the development of the notable hook echo we saw on radar and the Servatka video of the beefy wall cloud. Flash rates remained very low, about 1 to 2 per minute, through 3.24 p.m., about 8 minutes after the Plainfield tornado began. These findings support those of Perez et al. 1997, who analyzed 42 violently tornadic storms in an attempt to find patterns in cloud-to-ground lightning associated with violent tornadoes. They found that about three-quarters of these storms exhibited a peak in lightning frequency prior to tornado formation, and about half exhibited a decrease in lightning frequency coincident with tornado genesis, with a lag time of, on average, 17 minutes between peak lightning flash frequency and tornado formation. Similar decreases in lightning frequency during tornado genesis were noted in the May 25, 1955 supercell that produced two F5s that devastated Blackwell, Oklahoma, and Udall, Kansas, as well as in the May 22, 1981 supercell that produced an F4 tornado near Binger, Oklahoma. Perez et al. also discovered that storms exhibiting a majority of positive flashes were generally associated with more intense, long-track tornadoes. The Plainfield Storm also exhibited a clear shift in lightning polarity from the vast majority positive to the vast majority negative around 3.18 p.m., coincident with tornado formation. This is believed to be quite rare. Only six of the 42 storms studied by Perez et al. 1997 underwent such a polarity reversal. It's unclear if or how this shift was related to tornado genesis, and it's unclear what causes all of these behaviors, but it likely has to do with changes to the microphysics and dynamics within the storm itself, including changes in updraft strength. Another interesting feature of the Plainfield tornado was that it shrank considerably immediately before producing its small swath of F5 damage. In his plate 23 here, Fujita outlines the area of F5 damage, and you can see that the diameter of the tornado's core, which is shaded in gray, decreases from about 70 meters wide as it approaches U.S. Highway 30 to about 10 meters wide, coincident with the beginning of F5 damage, before expanding again to about 70 meters wide. During this portion of the path, several vehicles were picked up and tumbled across the adjacent cornfields, including a tractor, a 20-ton trailer that was tossed 1,150 feet, bouncing five times, and a car that made a full revolution around the small but extremely intense tornado. Extensive ground scouring occurred in the adjacent cornfields, and other parts were left exposed where corn crops had been plucked out thanks to suction vortices. Other crops had been stripped of their leaves and flattened. This increase in intensity coincident with vortex constriction goes back to the classic figure skater analogy. As this figure skater brings her arms in, she spins much faster. A similar phenomenon happens with tornadoes. As the vortex constricts, you're concentrating all that spin into a much smaller area, so the tornado may actually intensify as it constricts. Here's an example from the famous Ashby, Minnesota EF4 on July 8th, 2020. Notice how small the vortex is, yet how rapidly it's rotating, just chucking corn stalks out of the ground. It's likely producing some of its most intense flow at this point in its life cycle. The same thing happened in the Plainfield case. To close things out, I wanted to mention a good analog to the Plainfield case. If you glanced at the sounding analog retrieval system on our Romeoville proximity sounding from earlier, you may have noticed two analogs for the Plainfield environment. The first one is the actual evening observed sounding from Peoria, Illinois on August 28, 1990, but the second one is the 18Z sounding at Lincoln, Illinois on July 13, 2004. 
On this day, a violent F4 tornado tore a nearly 10-mile-long path through the suburbs of Peoria, near the town of Roanoke. The Plainfield and Roanoke setups were quite similar. I don't want to go too deeply into the Roanoke case, as we'll do a full breakdown at some point in the future, but we'll at least give you the gist of the environment. Here is the 500 millibar chart near the time of the Roanoke tornado, and you can clearly see that this was another typical northwest flow setup. A bit of a jet streak sandwiched in between a shortwave trough to the northeast and a ridge to the southwest. At the surface, a cold front was draped across western Illinois with a very warm, moist air mass in place across the region. Temperatures approaching 90 with dew points in the upper 70s, which is, again, fairly common during the summer in the Midwest. This led to explosive instability. Over 4,500 joules per kilogram mix layer cape and 130 joules per kilogram 3 cape on the 1 p.m. observed sounding at nearby Lincoln, Illinois. However, just like the Plainfield case, the wind profile left a lot to be desired. While there was some veering of the low-level winds with height, those winds were quite weak, leading to limited low-level shear, although we did have adequate deep layer shear for supercells. So again, even though we had explosive instability in place, low-level shear just wasn't supportive of significant tornadoes, so we needed something to augment the low-level environment. A supercell fired in far northwest Illinois around 10 a.m. and moved southeast, producing large hail up to 4 inches in diameter and a brief F0 tornado. By noon to 1 p.m., this supercell was producing extensive outflow and an outflow boundary surged out ahead of it. This appeared to intersect an ambient boundary draped southwest to northeast across the area, as illustrated in this visible satellite image taken at 2.03 p.m., about a half hour before the Roanoke tornado began. At the intersection of the outflow boundary and the ambient boundary, additional convection developed, including a couple supercells near Roanoke. The first one put out an outflow boundary itself that surged southward and appeared to interact with the developing second supercell near Metamora. This second storm takes on a classic supercell shape with a well-defined hook echo, and tornado genesis was consummated. With such strong low-level and deep layer instability, the vorticity from the first storm's outflow boundary likely was tilted and stretched extremely efficiently into the vertical to aid in tornado genesis and augment the weaker ambient low-level shear. As a result, we got a violent tornado in an environment that didn't really support it at first glance, just like the Plainfield case. All right, that's going to wrap things up for this case study. I know a lot of you had been waiting for this one for a while now, so hopefully you enjoyed it and learned a thing or two about how the Plainfield tornado did what it did, even with the scarcity of higher quality data to analyze. This was a really unique case that shows that the atmosphere has to be just right for these violent tornadoes to occur, but in these extreme instability environments, all it takes is a little interaction with something like an outflow boundary, even a storm's own outflow boundary, and you're off to the races. So with that, thanks for watching, and we'll see you in the next video.